Hello and welcome to the StoryGrid podcast. My name is Tim Grawl. I'm the CEO of StoryGrid Universe, and I'm a struggling writer trying to figure out how to tell a story that works. This episode is a little different. One is it's coming out on a Tuesday instead of a Thursday. The other is Sean's not going to join me, Danielle, Leslie, and they're not going to join me. Instead, I did an interview with Randall Searles and Scott Mann. So Scott Mann is the author of a book that just came out called Operation Pineapple Express. And it's all about the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the role that Scott played in trying to get people out of Afghanistan safely. Randall Searles is a StoryGrid certified editor. We've had him on before to talk about projects, and he was one of the editors on this particular project and worked really closely with Scott on writing the book, doing all of the interviews, pulling it together, and getting it ready because they had a really short timeline, which we talk about in the interview. This was actually really interesting to me because one is, of course, Randy's involved. They're using StoryGrid. Uh, they're using it on a project uh, with a traditional publisher, Simon & Schuster. And I was really interested in that side of things. But I was also interested in how they dug in to find the story theme, the controlling idea, and how that helped them craft this story. I think a lot of times uh, when people are writing books, uh, I think this idea of telling a true story is often harder because in fiction, you can make up whatever you want to make up. But in uh, when you're telling a story that actually happened, it's an editing job. You have to figure out how to take this giant thing, all these different things that happen. You know, it's it's a word that or a phrase that Sean likes to use a lot, combatorially explosive, right? There's so many different things you could put in the book. How do you decide what to cut out and how do you decide what to actually put in the book and how do you make sure it all hangs together? And of course, it comes to this idea of a controlling idea. So this is a really important book. I really highly recommend you go and you read it. Ever, uh, I had only read a small portion of it when I did the interview. I've gone on to read a lot more of it. It's a fantastic book. Um, and I think it's a really, really powerful story. Um, even if you don't know anything about what happened in Afghanistan or you have a really strong opinion about it, um, I think this is a book that's going to cross political divides, partisan stuff, and really cross time. Uh, as I talk about a little bit in it, um, it's a really strong controlling idea that I think will strike to the heart of all of us because they ask a question that we all have to come up against at some point. So it's a really interesting interview. Uh, we really talked about a lot of things about working with an editor, how to write a book under a short timeline. Uh, but again, I think the most powerful thing we talked about was this idea of landing on a really solid controlling idea and how that helps you in the writing. So it's a really fun interview. I think you're really going to enjoy it. So let's jump in and get started. All right, Scott. So I want to start with you and just you kind of give me what this book is about. Like, uh, you know, what's your description when somebody asks you what the book's about? Uh, what, what do you, what do you tell them? Yeah, this is something Randy and I talked about like in the very beginning. And if for me, it is really simple. It comes down to what does a promise mean to you and how far would you go to honor it? Like that's what this book's about in, in, in the highest stakes environment you could possibly imagine. Uh, when people's lives are on the line and, and everything is falling apart, what does a promise mean and how far would you go to honor it? And, and it examines that, I think, in you know, just real world detail uh, through storytelling. Yeah, I'll tell you, um, I haven't read the whole thing yet. I read like the beginning and then I skipped to the end. And, uh, I got like emotional, like it had already hooked me. And so I thought, and it was really interesting. You know, we talk a ton of story grid about double factor problems, which is basically problems that aren't a clear black or white, right? They're, they're always answered with it depends. And I really thought you nailed that with this book as well. But, but besides even that higher level thing, just, uh, you know, what's the book about? Yeah, it's it, it's about the um, the collapse of Afghanistan. That's the setting uh, in 2021. And it's 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 about a group of Americans who came together to volunteer and try to help as many Afghan partners and allies as they could 
uh, get to safe passage before the last American plane left the country. Well, Randy, I want to ask you the same question because I'm sure you have a slightly different perspective because you were the editor on the project, not the writer per se. So uh, when you think about the book, what do you think the book's about? Well, first of all, I was one of a couple different editors, so I don't want to take, I don't want to take stuff away from some other people that were involved. But um, when we first started talking about this, when Scott per- first invited me on to on board, it was hard to it was hard to come up with the promise was the was was the actual what the book was about. We always knew it was going to be about Afghanistan. We also knew that there was going to be a variety of characters and there was going to be a couple that would stand out as primary characters and then there was going to be a bunch of other characters. But it, it's about people and it's about relationships, right? It's about the relationships between the Americans and the Afghans. It's about the relationships between the Afghans too. It's about the, the, the villain is the Taliban and it's about the relationships between those people and the Taliban and also the changing almost crazy, you know, different relationship that a lot of Americans had with the Taliban during the time of this fall of Afghanistan, because up until that moment, the Taliban were the enemy. You saw them, you killed them. And now, in a way, they were semi-assisting us in, 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 in some ways. And, and they weren't, and they weren't, they were right there with us and we weren't shooting at each other. So it was, it's all about relate. It was all about relationships and the, and changing relate ever changing relationships all through the book. There's, there's realizations on all sides about how things are changing and how, and, and, and trying to get to the objectives uh, through those relationships. You said it took you a while to come to that. So Scott, how did Simon and Schuster approach you about this book or how did this book come about and how was it first pitched? Because to me, I'm guessing it was something like, Hey, you know, we want you to write about this thing in Afghanistan. And yet you ended up writing this book about a much deeper question. Yeah. And, and, and I think the other thing too, Tim, is that I was living it at the time, right? So, you know, I had, I had, as a green beret, I had moved on from my time in service. I had retired just like Randy had, uh, I retired a little bit before he did, I think. And, and I, I was in a different place in my life. I was, you know, a playwright, an actor, um, and, had written other books, but they were either self-published or, or, or smaller houses, that kind of thing, very niche. And when Afghanistan collapsed, you know, I found myself like many other volunteers working to help a friend that, that was really the extent of it. And then it just blew up from there where, you know, it became a kind of a free for all to help a whole bunch of friends. And, it was in the aftermath of that, literally, where the ISIS-K explosion had happened. The suicide bomber had detonated himself on 26 uh, August, and w- it, it's kind of like you're just looking around going, what the hell just happened? Like, you haven't slept in 10 days. Um, everything that you thought you knew about your life and your time in, in war was torn asunder. And I mean, I was questioning everything. And then I started getting these because pineapple was pretty visible, I guess, in the media and that kind of thing. So I started getting these inquiries about writing a book and a movie. And it really, I'll be honest, it pissed me off because I'm like, that's the last thing in the world I want to friggin' do right now is write some damn book about this shit show that just happened. Like, I mean, and I, that's, I'm just being honest. Like, that's not what I wanted to do, but, um, it was several mentors, uh, Randy being one of them, we talked about it, was like, look, if you don't tell it, somebody's going to tell it. And, and, and so that was, I started to kind of come around to that, that maybe I could be the storyteller on this thing in a way that really honored the journey of those that lived it. And I started thinking about writing it in third person. Well, anyway, uh, one other person gave me some sound advice. Hey, get an agent for this one, pal, because you do not know what you're doing here and, and they're going to come at you a million ways to Sunday. So I did that and, and it ended up being, um, I'm glad that happened because we went through a process to select the right publisher and Simon and Schuster to me really got it. They understood the importance of not only 
telling this story authentically, but getting it out in a year, for God's sake, on the on the anniversary, they were adamant about that, just like we were. So that was the process for it. But even then, and this was like September, October, I was still wrestling with the fact that, man, I can't believe I'm going to try to write and tell this story after this. It was so raw. Well, and how did you two meet, Randy and, uh, and Scott? How did you guys meet? So I'll start... Uh, and then he can jump in. But uh, Randy and I both were in special forces together. But not only were we in special forces together, we were in the same unit. Like we were in seventh special forces group uh, at the same time for years. But the way it works in special forces is if you're not in the same battalion, really, if you're not even in the same company, you're gone so much that you could literally be a half mile from each other and never know that person on that team. And that is exactly what happened to us. I'm sure we crossed paths, but I didn't know Randy until a friend of his uh, recommended that he come see my play last out uh, elegy of a green beret in New York city. He came with his family and we ended up connecting. I happened to be writing. This was how long ago, Randy? 2018. I want to say I went, I went to see your play in New York. Yep, in New York City. And then uh, I was writing a book, Tim, called Rooftop Leadership um, at the time. And I asked Randy to come in because I knew he was, you know, from StoryGrid. And I had become familiar with StoryGrid. I actually knew Sean almost immediately after I transitioned. I'd met him through Steve Pressfield. And um, he and I had become, you know, like like acquaintances and had worked together on some projects. And so knowing that Randy was out of story grid like and a sergeant major and i was really keen to have him work with me on my rooftop book he tore it apart like literally tore it apart and and we ended up starting over um and then we went all the way through that and this is why i wanted to go first we went all the way through it like a year and then he he goes hey you should go to this big idea workshop this nonfiction big idea workshop in nashville So I did, and I listened to you and Sean riff for another weekend, and I got outside and I called Randy. I was like, you asshole, we're starting over again. Uh, And we did, and we did because it was great. It was a great workshop, and it really helped me really get clear on what a big idea nonfiction book is. But Randy and I have known each other, I mean, for years we've been working on projects, and it just so happened that when the pineapple thing kicked off, I I called him up and I was like, brother (laughs) – I can't do this without you. Like, you're going to have to help me. And he was kind enough to drop everything and and jump in with me. You got anything to add, Randy? Well, first of all, I left, uh, I left group for about four years in 2007. The last time I went to Afghanistan was 2007. And, uh, and shortly after that, Scott became more well-known in special forces because he started the, village stability operations he kind of helped it nudge it along uh and started the train a training for that which is where a lot of these relationships were built that were in the book and uh, he also wrote a book called game changers that described how that was used in afghanistan by green berets and i didn't know any of this uh i went to uh i went to columbia for four years i came back in 2012 and the, the, the guy who introduced us, Chris, uh, he's like, hey, you're so smart in Columbia. We need to have these briefings that Scott Mann did for Afghanistan, all these experts to t- talk all our guys about Columbia. I was like, I had no idea what you're talking about. I don't know who Scott Mann is. I don't know what briefings you're talking about. But it sounds like a great idea. So, But uh, Chris was my commander. So that's, that's how, you know, other than that, that's how he, he's the one that introduced us. He's the one that said I should go to the play. My parents and I went to the play. Scott is a really, uh, you know, he's a kind of a forward thinker in that when he does his uh, plays, he has, after the play is done, all of the actors and directors come out and they sit down with the audience and they talk to the audience about veterans issues and some of the themes that were in the play. And, um, and I had an opportunity. I was like, Hey, uh, you know, Chris told me to come to your play. And he's like, yeah, I know exactly who you are. Your story. We need to talk. And that's how, you know, what, what, like he said, that's how we got together. Uh, and then we spent two years on your leadership book, rooftop leadership that hopefully will come out at the end of this year. And we were about 
two weeks from being done when Af- when he went dark because Afghanistan started falling. And I'm like, hey, are you going to do this edit? I, you've had it for like three weeks. I mean, I, don't, I didn't talk to him like that, but I was like, I was like in my head, I'm like, what's going on? We're like almost finished. It's right there. Reach up, grab it. You know, the orange. And uh, and I he, he's like, hey, I I gotta I gotta I'll, I'll later. And um, I since I never I haven't been back to Afghanistan until 2007. All of my relationships, I already helped my interpreters get out of Afghanistan. I wrote them notes. They had visas. They were training, language training in the states. I don't really, I didn't really have a lot of other Afghanistan people, uh, Afghani's that I that I that needed help getting out at that time. So when all this was going down, I was I had my own feelings about, you know, whether what was going on and how, what those twenty years meant. But I didn't have a lot of friends that were Afghanis that were trapped there. And so I wasn't I wasn't called in on this. And Scott kept trying to bring me in, but I was like, I don't want to there seems like there's a lot of people going on, it's just kind of chaotic. I don't want to step in there and, and not be able to help and just cause more commotion. So I didn't I wasn't very aggressive. I would go into the chat rooms that were in the book and listen and watch and see if anyone needed anything that I could assist with. But most people were already running with the ball doing things they with people they knew and were really invested in it. And so I didn't see a really a place for me at the time. And then, uh, and, and I didn't really understand what was going on and what they were doing until, you know, he called me and said, Hey, I need a project manager. And I was like, I don't know what that does. And, and he's like, well, I'm going to write up a contract. And the contract says, you'll do whatever we ask you to do. <laughs> and, and I said, okay. And so that's how we, that's how we started working together. Um, but, uh, and then I, and then I'm Simon and Schuster, I'm sure the first couple of meetings we had with Simon and Schuster editors and, and people, they're like, who's this guy? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, uh, and then also he actually, he asked me to look at his play too. And I, I don't know if I he took any of my suggestions, but over when, when over COVID he actually made his play into a movie and it's on net, it's on Amazon now you can buy it on Amazon. So it, uh, so we, we worked on that for a little bit too. When Scott, you know, with you signing a, you know, a deal with Simon and Schuster, I'm sure they had their own editors, their own team. Um, so when you were looking at the project, what made you think like, I got to have Randy on this project? That's a great question. Well, there were a couple of things. One is I had worked with Randy, you know, I have an immense appreciation for story grid as a, as an approach, right. And, and both writing, editing, and I had, I had worked with Randy on it with my own book. That was my heart. You know, it was, it was all the lessons I'd learned on leadership coming out of special forces. And so I, I knew that whatever this book was going to be, it was going to be, the expectations were going to be enormous. You know, it was the responsibility of carrying, of telling these stories that otherwise would not be told that, that voices just that did not have, they did not have a voice. And, and, and that really bothered me in the sense that I felt like, okay, I, I can, I am a storyteller. I'm an oral storyteller. I'm a decent writer, but, um, I really need the discipline and rigor and structure, um, that I know comes with story grid and what it, and, 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 and how you can really hammer and chisel out a, the true narrative, the true story of, of, of what's going on. And that's going to be required. Like there's not going to be any appetite for fluff or, or anything that's just, you know, not the, just the efficiency and emotional resonance of the story itself. And I had gone through such a journey with Randy over, I mean, I'm not even kidding. He's serious. We were 98% of the way done with the book and it was a two year journey. And we shelved it, you know, to do this project. And so I knew that he could bring that to it. And I think he was a little reluctant at first because of the fact that Simon and Schuster was, you know, at the helm of this thing. And, and I told him, I said, I don't really care about that. What I care about is like, we are going to have to interview all of these people. Some of them are still in Afghanistan. Some of them are severely traumatized. We have like 45 days to do that on Zoom. Then we're going to have to write this sucker in like 120 days, you know, and then or, you know, some maddening number. It wasn't much 
somewhere between four and six months. And then we're going to have to, you know, submit it and get it out the door for the anniversary. So I just, I don't know. I just, I, I, I knew that working together, we could probably have a chance. And I felt like working solo, there was no chance. There was no way I was going to be able to, to carry that load and, and do that and it, or, or produce what people deserved. So that was my rationale on it. And, and I just, I, I trusted him, not just as a, as a story grid editor, but also as a sergeant major, as, as a guy that, you know, really got what this was. Like he understood it at a visceral level and he took it very seriously. And I, and that's what I needed like above all. Yeah. I, I always think it's interesting um, because this is, you know, this is a true story. This is a memoir basically. And yet you've got to write it in a way where it's, uh, it's interesting and it has narrative drive. And I always, I, I always wonder like, is, uh, is memoir and true stories like harder because you can't just make up whatever you want to happen next. So, uh, and this could be a question for both of you, but how do you approach that when you're thinking through like, okay, this is a true story. And now it's not just like a normal memoir where it's like, you know, my sad life, right? This is an actual important story um, that you got to tell truthfully, but you also need to do in a way where people will actually read the book to the end. And so how do you approach that, a true story while applying, you know, narrative drive, narrative techniques to make it an interesting story? If, if, we're, if we're talking about the story grid, I started with the five commandments. I, I, you know, Scott was already familiar with it. Uh, talked it through with some of the other editors, and they're like, "Yeah, okay, we'll, 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 we'll mess around with it." But, uh, but the, the the key was it's the, it's very uniquely written in that some of the scenes are like super super short, and it's almost it was almost impossible to get five commandments out of it. But what, what, I, what I was looking for was looking for a turning point slash crisis question for each, let's, let's call it a sequence, you know, each group of scenes involving a specific character and, and, and kind of evolving the whole thing around that. Like, there's, I don't know, there's probably 15 secondary characters that all have pieces of their story told chronologically through the book. And you might not have gotten that far, Tim, but uh, I wanted, you know, it was really important to Scott and, and, and me and I to make sure that all their stories were res resolved, right? They made choices during their, the, during the, the two weeks of this, of this book. They made choices to, to, to risk their families. They made choices to, to quit. Some of them didn't even get out. Uh, don't, I won't tell you who they are, so I don't want to ruin it for you. But, you know, some of them, some of them died uh, because of their choices. But, um, but they made choices, and then there's a resolution to that choice that they made. So, the, you know, that's the, the crisis, the climax, and the resolution. And, you know, when we finished the when we own, we thought we finished the book, we looked at the the final chapters and like, hey, we we got to resolve some of these people because I know they're going to read this book and go, what happened to what's his name, you know? So so we we really we really hammered in and resolve, tried to resolve all of the secondary characters at the very least, and then um, also trying to write the scenes with an inside incident. I mean, the, we really focus on the five commandments. This is a really it's not a book I've ever. I ever imagined writing and it's not a book that I ever imagined, uh, you know, trying to figure out. It's very unique in that the first half of the book is about one, pretty much one person in his relationship with a, a variety of Americans that helped him get out. And then the second half of the book is about everybody else. And so, and he's a, he's a small piece of that, but a very small piece of the rest of the book. And so but he still needed a resolution at the end of the book. You know, we almost forgot to put in there, but, but Kind of, kind of worked out it just just yeah, just as we were finishing the writing the book um, that you know some more information about where he was in life came out so um, the the other piece I tried to like first of all Scott I, I feel like it was three months you're saying four to six months but there's three months of rewrites and whatever but the thing the thing was it was three months and we started two weeks late because 
we thought that Simon Schuster would have a better plan. And, and then we just, we got, we got tired of waiting and we made a plan. So it was really, really, really quick turnaround on getting the first draft out. And then we had at least two major rewrites and then a couple other kind of small rewrites. And, and, and as a result, you know, if I had two years with it, like Scott, Scott, one day, I, I think I was I'm through the second rewrite or something. Scott's like, Hey, is this a really good book? Can we make it better? And I was like, I think we're at like 90, 95% Scott. And you know, if we had another year, we could bring it up to 99, but is it worth it? And, you know, is it worth it? Because, you know, it'll be more significant coming out on the anniversary of what happened than, than delaying it. And, you know, if you want to delay it till Christmas, will it be that much better to make a difference? Because does it all match? Does every, does every scene and does every character arc match a kind of a five commandments kind of thing or a, the conventions or the obligatory moments? Absolutely not. Um, but we, we had that goal to begin with and, and we, we tried our best, but also real life doesn't always give you those answers as well. So, um, and my experience with memoirs and true stories like this is you really need to, during the interviews, and we had to go back and re-interview people to get the answers to some of these questions. You look for that moment where there's a turning point leading to a crisis question. And it's not always obvious. It's, it's not, it's not a turning point crisis question when they're faced with death and they choose life. That's an obvious, that's an obvious direction, right? The question is, um, there, there's, there's more nuanced stuff that you have to look for. And you go into the interview ideally with questions, trying to dig those out, of the interviews. So it's a different process. And, and we by no means got it right every single time. And sometimes there was no interview. There's no second or third interview because they're in Afghanistan. Communication is horrible or they're in hiding in a different country or there's, they're evading through Afghanistan to get out of the country and there's no way to reach these guys again, or they don't want to, they don't care to talk to you because you left them behind. <laughs> so, so there's, there's a lot of PTSD and there's a lot of bitterness. And, and so you get, sometimes you get one shot and you, you kind of have to also craft those crisis questions as potential crisis questions. I don't know what he was thinking. I get a chance to ask him again. I didn't ask the right questions when I had the interview, but I can kind of picture what he might've been going through. And I can pose that as a potential crisis question, like what he could have been thinking. And that's another way we, we, we addressed some of the issues. And I would just say from a narrative drive perspective, Tim, like, as I thought about it, you know, as, as a storyteller, like, how in the world are we going to break this thing down to a, to a way that it's readable and it's digestible and it, and you just, you don't want to stop turning the pages because that's what it was like when you were in it. Like it was so fast and so intense, like you didn't sleep, you didn't sleep, you didn't sleep for 10, 12, 14 days because you know, you literally had your phone on your chest and the first little buzz, you were back up on your phone. And because it, when we were asleep, they were moving. And when they were moving, we were you know, like periods of darkness were reversed. So you couldn't you, and you couldn't live with the guilt uh, if you woke up and somebody had, had been beaten or left alone. Like, you know, so I wanted I, I knew that capturing that intensity, I wanted the reader to feel what it felt like uh, for, yes, those Afghans that were wading through you know, knee high feces, feces filled trenches in 105 degree temperature with their children while getting beaten by a Taliban rubber hose. Like I wanted that level of emotional detail, but I also wanted people to understand, like to be sitting at the breakfast table with a double amputee who's trying to save the interpreter who saved him on the battlefield while his kids throwing cheese grits at him from the breakfast table, you know, and he's got his head down in his phone and He's reading a message about, um, you know, how this guy's wife's being beaten. And he's trying to, like, conceal that from his child because 
that's all he's done his whole life is to keep this kind of thing from his family. And now it's at his breakfast table, the one like safe haven he has, you know, and um, and I just thought, man, how in the world are we going to do that? And we just to me, I could see it. And, and the narrative drive for this was it had to be written in third person. It, it, it third person on this. It had to be written in a way that like it was not, hey, this is what I did at band camp rescuing my Afghan friend. Like it needed to be, you know, toggling back and forth, almost in a Dunkirk kind of way, that latest movie Dunkirk, where you're just toggling back and forth between these different points of view and you're just going for the ride, you know. And and then the last thing I'll say that I knew we had um, going for us in the story, the narrative tools, was we had two clocks. We had two ticking clocks. We had the 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 timeline of departure, which was stated as 31 August. And so, and we knew in the chat rooms and everything else that it was going to be more like 26 August because by the time you, you can't be pulling Afghans in on the last day of your evacuation. Like you've got to make way to get your own people out and, you know, posture yourself for self exfiltration. So we knew it was going to be around the 26th that it was going to wrap up and it started on the 15th, right? So you've got a definite ticking clock there and then you have very early on in the process the um the threat of the suicide bomber from isis k like the threat the threat stream reporting is profound and you know that it's going to happen like you know it's going to happen like whatever conversations in the chat room like how long do we have like these people are all combat veterans they are all analysts like they know that this is going to happen and it's more about you know how do we make the most of the time we have? And so you've got these two ticking clocks that are happening that I think lend a tremendous amount of urgency to the drive in the story. And then finally, you're on your, if you're a shepherd, you're on your phone. So you're literally looking at the action through a soda straw. You know, you've only got one little microcosm of what's going on. And then it's in the chat rooms where information is revealed by what other people are seeing. And then all of a sudden you toggle, toggle to the commando wading through the canal with his children in his arms and his wife at his side and you're looking through his eyes and then you're back to looking through the soda straw so all of those to me seemed like really useful tools and then as randy was talking about bringing the rigor and structure of the story grid into it it allowed us to to play with those openly but yet still bound ourselves in a way that was responsible and, and let us move to resolution when in the process did you realize this book was about making and keeping promises? It was epiphanal for me. Randy and I, and we had we were having a conversation, and it was we would do these pull up calls. God, I just thought about those. We were doing for so ninety days of just literally two, three thousand words a day, um, and we would pull up in the morning and we would pull up in the evening. And I had sequestered myself up in the mountains of North Carolina and was jamming away and randy and i got on a call and at some point i just remember saying to him you know what i think this thing is about is just two basic questions um it's 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 what what the hell does a promise mean to you and how far would you go to honor it because as i had started to get into the interviews and was asked i started asking that question and and it was amazing the the responses that we were getting and it just became so basic and simple to me and as soon for me as soon as that clarity i got that clarity everything changed like it just became for me it was like like i i for me i know that's what this is really this is really what this came down to for for, for those of us who fought in that war we gave our youth to that war we gave our friends to that war like man we we gave we gave it not all of some gave more than others but my god 20 years you know, and, and, and now you want us to w just walk away from these people like that, that, that some of us are here because of them. And just something as simple as what you learn in kindergarten, just a promise and, and standing by your friends when they're in trouble. Like that's really it. And what does that look like when people really do it? And what does it look like when people who you would expect don't? And the contrast in that is deafening. And so for me, that was uh, just super fulfilling and, and um, clear. And, and that's never changed for me. And the more I do this a year later and I 
I'm absolutely certain that was the right angle to take for this book. And is that what kind of helped you decide what to keep in the book and what to take out of the book? Because again, like if you did all of these interviews and just, you know, right at the beginning of the book is this just giant cast of characters that you're about to learn about in the book. And um, even though it's like 400 pages long, that's still heavily edited to what actually happened if you wrote it all down. So like what helped you like decide what to go in and what to leave out? We had at least probably somewhere between eight and ten other stories, other characters, which had sub-characters and other characters inside it. And we really had to look at two things. One, did they write a pineapple? Because some of them have extraordinary escape stories, but they, didn't, they weren't involved with what Scott created. Or if they were, it was very, it was very, it was, it was, a, it was a fingerprint, not a handprint or a, or a, or he carried them out, with, you know, with the, with the help of the pineapple. So we had to really go: How much did this person involved in, our, in the, the Pineapple Express, uh, you know, capability? And the second one was, you know, how much, how much relationship with the the what am I trying to say here? The the, 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 gosh, dang it. The relationship with, um, the prom, well, going back to the promise, the promise has to do with the United States promising Afghanistan by giving them 20 years of, you know, having, bringing this to a resolution. And also the promise of the individual American characters to the Afghani characters and their relationships. So finding a person who got out by themselves, which there weren't very many, and they weren't involved with someone from Pineapple once again, or there was no relationship there that we could, fig- we could, we could track, we could trace, we could touch, then, that, then we, that's when we had to really, I mean, it was hard for Scott. Like I, I, I said it a couple times, like, Scott, I don't think this guy goes in there. It's like, no, we got to put it in there. I was like, and I was like, I just don't think it goes in this book, Scott. Just, may, I don't think it goes in this book. And we had a bunch of conversations with this, and and you know, and and, and it was some of them were really hard to take out. Like, he's like, okay, okay, except I want to put a little bit here, a little bit there. I was like, no, no, I, I think we just take it all out. It's like, we'll just put a little bit here. It's like, I just don't think that guy has a has a, a story in this book, man. We can write another book, but I don't think this book. I think it's just not going to fit. It doesn't, doesn't fit the purpose. And, and understand too, Tim, that like, so as I was rolling into it from an author's perspective, my, my emotional connection to all these people was, you know, enormous and, and raw. And, and again, looking at it through a soda straw, I didn't even, honest to God, I didn't even really know when we agreed to write the book going into the interview process. I thought, I have no clue who, I mean, I knew some of the protagonists, like, for example, Zach. Zach is a former Green Beret turned inner city school teacher whose hero is Harriet Tubman, and he fashioned an underground railroad using paratroopers and Afghans to move them through a sewage-filled canal. I mean, are you shitting me? Like, that? that's, okay, yeah, that guy's definitely uh, a central character here. But, you know, then some of the others, I had no clue. Like, the Minister of Women's Affairs, one of the four female ministers in the country actually waded through that sewage filled canal and went out our apparatus. And we didn't even know who she was until afterwards we find out that she was like the most senior hunted, you know, uh, female leader in the country. And she had got out on the pineapple express. So like we didn't know, but it was clear as we interviewed her, we're like, yeah, definitely a primary character. So for me, it, what I tried to do was, was ask myself, all right, like Randy said, those criteria were there, but also who embodies certain thematic elements of what this thing was that, you know, they're kind of a universal singular for all of that. Like Hasina represented to me um, what so many at-risk women in Afghanistan were and are going through. Um, there was um, another female NCO who we felt like really embodied the pride 
and um, uh, underrepresented voices of female Afghan soldiers. Um, there was an American citizen who was not going to leave his family behind. He refused to follow State Department directives and was not going to leave his parents. That embodied so many AMSITs that America is furious about, right? And so that was the other thing is I wanted to, again, in a Dunkirk kind of way, you to sit in that cockpit with a fighter pilot on, you know, and feel like you understand the whole Royal Air Force's perspective. Like, same thing. Like, if you walk with this one commando through this canal, you got a pretty good read on what the commandos went through. So that was my, and that was very arbitrary. And so, like, I had the thematics in my mind, and then I would have to, you know, do jujitsu with Randy on which one stayed and went. And, and, but overall, man, at the end of the day, and I think he would agree with this, like, I didn't, I didn't override any of them. Like, if, if he said they needed to go, they went. Because I knew I was close to it. And I knew that, you know, it would be, uh, that he would actually have a better call on that than me. I knew I'd wear him down. And that, when we got to the last three days, I was like, okay, we're going to throw this guy out, right? You're like, whatever. I was like, okay. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because um, it, it's so interesting to hear you guys talk about this and hear you guys land on things that we've been talking about more in recent times in Story Grid. Um, like, okay, so a couple weeks ago, I was in Colorado at this thing, and I met this guy that runs, his name's Josh Scott. He runs KHS Pedals. It's a guitar pedal company. And he's working on this book. And he's like, he's like a fucking like guitar historian. Like he can tell you everything that's ever happened around the guitar since you know, the beginning of guitars thousands of years ago. And he he was trying to write this story or trying to, he's working on this book. And I was like, well, why do you, and he's having the same trouble. What do you put in? What do you take out? And I was like, well, what are you trying to say? Why does this matter to you that these stories get out there? Because we all read it, you know, we all went through a U.S. history book when we were growing up. And it was like, on this day, this happened. On this day, this happened. And nobody gives two shits except to pass the, past the test and i think what was so interesting in this case is the way that you landed on that fundamental question and really controlling idea about promises and then once you have that like that's a question that everybody has to ask ask themselves in their life right like i've never been to war but i have to ask that question you know, I have to ask that question in my marriage, with my kids, with my business, with my friends. Like, that's a question you bump into all the time. And I want to get to a question to you, Randy, on this, because inside a story grid, we talk about how, like, the the editor's job is to stand in the gap for the reader, right? Like, you're there to make sure the final product is something that will change the reader's life. And so when you are approaching these things and you're trying to decide what to tell Scott to keep in and what to tell Scott to, to take out, like what kind of, again, what kind of things are you, you thinking through to make those decisions and make those suggestions? Well, as far as the characters are concerned, you know, I, I, I'm very, I'm very spreadsheet oriented, I guess, for lack of a better word. So I started making, and, and, and some of this was, it was, uh, you know, kind of Scott's like, Hey, I need a spreadsheet that does this and this and this is like, I already got that. I just, he's like, Oh, okay. And, and then I was like, I just got to tweak it. And then I'd show it to him and it would be like how, which character showed up in which act, for instance, and, um, and, uh, and how many times and what he's doing. And, and if, if, if we had two characters that was were pretty similar, like we, we, we had a couple of incidences where like, Hey, we have these four characters are all special operation Afghan. He's trained by Americans with an American who's, who's guiding him out. It, are they different enough with a family with four to six kids trying to get out? So are they too similar? We need to tell different a, you know a different diversity of stories and we can, and so really we got to look at these and say are they are they different enough to include in the book and because they're both they're all four extraordinary stories and they're all four you know really heartbreaking 
But if you heartbreak them in the same way every time, it loses its strength. So we looked at that. We looked at it that way. The the great thing that Scott did was come up with the promise, which we he and when you asked when that came up, we had a we had we started two weeks late because we didn't have a, we had we had done all the interviews all the way through December, and we had we had, we had a uh, we had a really great proposal which had a lot of starter uh, introduction and starter stuff, but we didn't have a plan on how it was going to get written. And, uh, and we didn't have this mantra of the promise at the moment. And, you know, that once we had the promise, then we went forward and said, okay, this is, you know, this is what act one is going to look like. This is what act two, like this is what act three is. And it was a combination of Scott and I batting it back and forth and and then making us PowerPoint slideshow because we're Green Berets and that's what we're best at besides killing people, I guess, is making making us PowerPoint spreadsheet. And we were like, okay, this is the act. These are the people in the acts. These are the relationships in the acts. And we started and then and then we looked at it and like, all right, this act's really long and it's got relationships that are very similar. So do we need those? And does do all of them have promises involved and the overarching promise? And it was. It, it it took about a month to get it rolling, and once we started getting the spreadsheet filled out, which was my job, and once we started, you know, and 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 I wasn't in every interview, I was feeding them sometimes information to ask in the interview, but I was transcribing the interview and then taking the information and putting it in my spreadsheets, and and so. I didn't want to listen to it twice, for lack of a better word. So I didn't go to the interviews a lot of times. I would transcribe it and listen to it there and then, and then put it in these spreadsheets. So after the first month, once we really got a handle on what the promise meant and wh- how we wanted to get a diverse cast and not have these things that were similar, that's how we kind of decided who we're going to eliminate, what scenes we don't really need because they're similar and things like that. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I guess I, I would um, just add, and I don't even know where this fits, but I just I keep thinking about the the workshop in Nashville and, and you know, the, the big idea um, nonfiction approach. And one of the things, Tim, that came to, to me as we I mean, it was in my it was in my heart. But as we as we started talking about how the book ends and how it lands was it always it always just struck me. Um, about in how in a big idea book that you know it, it it goes in a different direction at the end. There's a there's a you know there's a real turn in polarity there, and I felt that like I'm like yeah man like this may not be like the you know the, the quintessential big idea book like it's certainly heavier on the memoir side, but there is a question I'm going to ask at the end that I don't think anybody's going to see coming, you know, and um, I think it's it's it, it brings it home right and and I just. It just felt good to think about it, and it felt good to know that I I could do that, and and it was okay to do that. And I just I want to throw a shout in in, in in all seriousness to you and Sean for gifting me that because I I came to that very very early in the process, and and I knew that's how I was going to land that chopper. Like I knew that's what it was going to be, and that it was an extremely generous thing that could be done is to let the reader really think about this question in their own life and and um and uh, i would never i don't think have given myself permission to do that or even known that was an option uh, in this you know and i think it everybody i've i've, I've used and, and randy will attest to this like i've given a lot of talks on the book already and i asked that question at the end and it's the thing that everybody comes up at the end and says wow man thank you for that like i didn't see that coming and and you can tell they're introspective and they're looking at their own arena, and damn, like that's that's why we do this, I think. And and it, it really, I mean, you guys are seriously onto something with that. And it was so cool to see that even as a possibility in something as heavy as this. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, we're talking about the surprising but inevitable end, right? And um, yeah, I think that's what is so interesting to me with the book like uh what you've written here and other ones that we would all probably kind of talk about is this idea that like 
I think what I love about this is that it's not just a book about what happened in Afghanistan, right? Because there is a really small number of people that would read a book that's just like, you know, kind of listing out details of what happened. Um, where this is a story where you're trying to get people to see the world in a certain way. And then, um, and even the way that you set it up, you give them something, you know, you like right hook them when they're not looking right at the end of the book. And I think that's such an important thing. And what I think is fascinating, and maybe it was just the whole like, you know, having to operate in such tight constraints of writing the book so fast. But it's like the fact that you guys landed on that when you did saved you so much time and effort of like, you know, landing on the controlling idea, landing on where the book was going to end, allowed you to make those uh, those decisions along the way when you only have three months to write this entire book. Um, yeah, I just think that was that that was fascinating. Yeah, it really helped. It really did. It helped and it gave us, I think, an anchor point throughout the whole thing, particularly when things got really dicey, and they did. There were some periods where the deadline and just the the dynamic realities of life, uh, it threw every just about every curve at us you could possibly imagine. And, and you know, the other thing too, man, and I got to say it, like it was nice to have a Green Beret with me on this because – there was just something because we there were times when we would both just start laughing the same way that you would laugh on a mission in the in the mountains in Afghanistan when like literally every fucking thing in the world has gone wrong and you just start laughing, you know, because there's like nothing else you can do. And and then it's OK, you know, and, and that was a lot of this. I, I, I got to say, I absolutely love working with Randy and, and we have a lot of fun and, you know, we it's been a real, really cool experience. Um, but there were some times, man, I didn't know. Like, I really wondered if we were going to make it to the, you know, in time because it just, it was so much. Yeah. And I, I was also interested since, um, you know, Randy, you're so steeped in story grid. And, but then working with Simon and Schuster, who probably has no idea what story grid is. And so what was, yeah, they do now. That's great. Uh, like, what was that like? Did they, did they care? Did that ever really come up? Were they just happy you were hitting your deadlines and it was written halfway decent or, or were they interested or did they ask questions? Like, did it ever kind of come up in that? I'm just curious their reaction to using something uh, like story grid so explicitly. You know, uh, I, I didn't call it story grid when we were talking to my talks shop with the other editors, but I, but I, I sometimes they would try to change stuff or cut stuff that I knew a was emotionally needed to be kept in there because they didn't understand the big picture and Scott was going to fight him on it. And then I had to explain it and I would use story grid verbiage, uh, uh, vocabulary to kind of say, Hey, you know, this is why this has to be in there because you haven't read the end yet, but it has to be in there. It's setting it up and you understand a setup and, and ultimately story grid helps you write a, a good story that works, right? That's the, the definition of story grid almost. And they can recognize a story that works. Uh, so we wrote a story that works. And there they had other editors that came in after Scott and I that we got to veto later on. And we did. Sometimes I'm like, that's not when we wrote that scene. That's not what we intended. We need to put some of that back. Um, and then in some cases... They did make it better. They were better with words. They had better word choice than we did, or they rearranged something and it made it better. We're not infallible, and neither are they. And so, and it, we ended up working pretty well with them um, in the end. I mean, they had two other editors involved, and most of the their editing was after Scott wrote. I edited and wrote, maybe did some fillers too. Not, he wrote most of it, and so after that was all done. We would submit it to the first inter first guy who was working with us through the whole thing almost, and he would we'd send the full the chapter, the sequence, the scene, whatever to him. He would mess with it, send it back. I would look at it. I would prepare Scott so he wouldn't tear his hair out, and say, "Hey, this is what he said. I think he's right, or I think 
you're, he, we're right. And we need to convince him we're right. And he was, he, he worked for Scott. He worked for us. Right. And so, but he also knew the business. So he knew what Simon and Schuster were expecting as well. And so that was a, that was a conversation we had a lot. And then there was another guy after we'd gotten through the first act and a half, another guy came on for just a week and he just read it start to finish and was like, this has got to go here for the big picture and stuff like that. Some of this stuff made sense and some of it was like out there, like, no, we're not doing that, put that back. And, uh, and, and in the end, Simon and Schuster were very, uh, you know, Hey, if Scott wants that in there, we're leaving it in there. That's, 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 that, that's how it ended. It was never like, if you don't put this in or take that or turn this, that it, it's over. It was always like, you know, if, if they, if there's three people against Scott and I, or against Scott and they said, Hey, we really, and Scott's like, I, I, I'm, I'm going to die on this. They're like, okay, we'll leave it in there. That only happened. That happened very rarely. And even when it did happen, we, it's still, it's still, he still agreed to a tweak or something like that. Cause he did, he didn't not see what they were saying. He just thought that was a really emotional part that had to be kept in the book. And the other thing, too, that, that gave us, Tim, that I think was a competitive advantage was that, you know, Randy's absolutely right. Like, there were a lot of people in the orbit around this book because they placed a lot of bets on this book early on. So they, you know, they were heavily invested in their human capital with it. But what I would say is what Randy and I had that nobody else had was we had a grammar for all of this, like, you know, and, and so I would even if, as I was starting to map each chapter out from inciting incident all the way down to resolution, like we had a grammar, like we had an outline, we, 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 you know, and he had really schooled me on that, uh, just in our interactions with rooftop leadership over two years. So like we had a way of talking about this that was, that was kind of funny because other people started to just pick up on it and they started to use those terminologies because it was a grammar that we could all get our head around. And I think looking back on it now, that was huge because when you've got that kind of a disparate, uh, diverse group of, of, of people trying to converge on this high stakes event, if you don't have a grammar or a language or a way of looking at the problem, like, man, you're, you're in trouble. And, and we had that, Randy gave us that. And I'll tell you the other thing too, and he won't tell you this, but, but I will is, it, he by the end of it, he he was quarterback in the whole thing, man. Like there was no doubt in anybody's mind, and the most senior editor at Simon and Schuster will tell you the exact same thing. Like he was quarterbacking the whole thing, and and I am convinced because a the methodology was sound, and he knew it and understood it, and everyone trusted it because they saw it happen again and again and again whenever we went up against walls. Um, but I think the other thing was just that there was a language for it, and I think it made everybody feel safer. Um, and and so by the end of it, when we were really out over our skis, you know, he was quarterback, and, and I think that was great because it gave me confidence, but it also gave everybody else confidence. And I, you know, I thought it was cool. I thought it was cool to see from the start where they're looking at like, hey, who the hell's this dude, and who let him in? to at the end like he's quarterback and and i think that was really great and and i think it was a, a real testament to what we were able to do and and the confidence that that organize that huge organization has in us now is off the charts like i mean <laughs> it's crazy the amount of confidence they have in us for the marketing side and everything else and i think it's a it's a direct result of that so it was it took some time but that that language and that process uh, definitely was entrenched at the end. So one, one, one other thing, Tim, is that the, our process, it, you know, the first four or five chapters were hard. We had to figure it out. But after that, I would, we would, we would talk about, Hey, this is what's going to be the first act, second act, third act. Right. So I would look forward and I would, I would extrapolate a five commandments for that chapter. And I would put that at the front of a, a template and say, I think the five commandments are this. I think, and then I would connect the transcript to all the, all the, uh, the, 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 the interviews that had anything to do with those five commandments so that they knew exactly where to find the information. And I would extrapolate quotes that would support those five commandments. And I would stick those in there underneath the five commandments. And that's what, and then Scott would roll after he finished the last chapter, he'd roll into that and like, 
and he may not, I mean, I think about 75, 80% of the time it worked out the way I thought it was going to be with the five commandments. But then, you know, we'd have a conversation. It's like, I don't think it's going to work. I think it should go like this. And I'm like, well, let's, let's see what happens. And we'd roll with it. But that's what we started doing is I started helping outline the stuff ahead of time, which gave Scott kind of marching orders. Like he's like, all right, now I know exactly what I'm looking for. And also, oh, I need to interview this person again because I need to understand what they were thinking about to get this crisis question stuff done. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, you know, like at night when you're moving on a rope and there's like knots in the rope, it's like that, that was kind of because you didn't know what the hell you were doing as you explored into each chapter, really. And it was just kind of those knots in the rope that gave you footing, you know, to, to build it out. Yeah. Um, all right. Let me let me end with this question for you, Scott. Now that. It's a year since this happened. You've gone through this process of writing the book. The book's coming out right on the year anniversary. Um, I'd like to hear from you, like what you're hoping happens as a result of people reading this book and kind of where you see that we're at now a year later. Yeah, I think I've, I've reached a level of clarity on the book. I've gone through the whole emotional roller coaster that I suspect every author goes through, particularly when they work for, you know, big organizations for the first time. And, you know, the project is bigger than they are. And, and I've gone through all that. I've gone through all that emotional agita of what I want this thing to be. And, and I think at the end of the day, what I've landed on is I just want people to care more about this problem than they do right now. And I hope that they will find some measure of clarity for their own life on how they can play a bigger game. Like if those two things happen at, at, at any level of scale, I would be an extremely happy guy. Like, I mean, I've just tried to keep it really simple. Um, just people to care more than they do right now and, 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 and get a bit deeper on what their pineapple express is on what it is that they um, want or, or can do when things fall apart. And um, yeah, that's it for me. I, I, and, and everything else will work itself out. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Story Grid podcast. For everything Story Grid related, check out storygrid.com. Make sure you sign up for the newsletter so you don't miss anything happening in the Story Grid universe. If you'd like to check out the transcript for this episode, any show notes for this episode, and to buy a copy of Operation Pineapple Express by Scott Mann, which I highly recommend. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, there's a link below in the description. If you are listening, you can go to storygrid.com slash podcast, and we put a link in the show notes there. Or, of course, just you know go to Amazon and search for it. I'm sure you can find it. If you want to access any past episodes of the StoryGrid podcast, you can go to storygrid.com slash podcast. And as always, to support the show, you can do that by telling another author about the show or by going to Apple Podcasts and leaving a rating and review. Thanks, as always, for being a part of our community here at StoryGrid. We'll see you in a couple days.